We're delighted to be able to have the opportunity to visit with Parley Bear this afternoon on our Those Were the Days Get Together. Parley, you're a, you're a kind of a transplanted Chicagoan, aren't you? Well, not uh, not really. I spent a lot of time in Chicago, but my <laughs> original routing was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake City. Uh huh. And then uh, moved to the West Coast, and then I used to come back uh, to Chicago. I did uh, publicity with the Medina Shrine Circus there, and mm -hmm. made guest appearances back there for oh my over twenty years. So I knew an awful lot of Chicago uh, people. Uh, Joe Slattery and uh, um, Mal Belair and oh, yes, uh, sure. Lee Phillip and the, the whole Chicago uh, yeah, gang. Irv Cupsonette, the whole right. gang, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everyone uh, would say hello to you. Well, <laughs> give them my regards I when shall. you see them. I shall. Where did your, uh, you, you started with the circus. Now, how did that come about? <laughs> <laughs> like the school teacher who who wound up as a call girl. Someone said, "How did you end up this way?" And she, she said, "Just lucky." So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I started out way back in the dark ages in outdoor mm -hmm. uh, amusement business, uh, and then uh, I went to uh, work for a radio station. Stock was in its uh, last final kick and I played uh, some stock and then um, World War II came along and uh, after the war uh, my wife Ernestine Clark who was a circus performer mm -hmm. I met her interviewing her oh. and she and I moved down to the coast we've uh, we will have been done uh, we will have been in Los Angeles about uh, well it was 37 years last February and since then, I've pretty much evenly divided my time between pictures, radio, television, and the circus. Uh, I've, I've spent parts of of every season, except during the war, with one circus or another since uh, 1936. Mm -hmm. Mostly doing uh, advance work, publicity, publicity work, things like that? ringmaster, performance uh -huh. director. Mm -hmm. You did something with the circus on television uh, not too many years ago, didn't you? Well, you I... Involved in something? Yes, I I was with worked with Bob Yerkes on the first uh, Circus of the Stars. Ah, oh, that's it. Uh -huh. That was on, and uh, I, whenever I'm cast as a circus performer or ringmaster, they they generally think I'm not the type, so <laughs> I don't get the part. <laughs> <laughs> Although it was only your job for that's, many that's years. Right. That's right. <laughs> well, that's always the that's always sure. the way. Uh, I think it was uh, Herb Vigran who was telling us that. Uh, uh, he had a certain kind of uh, oh, it was Sh uh, Sheldon Leonard who said that uh, uh, he was so typecast as a gangster, tough guy, Damon yeah. Runyon type all the time that sometimes that they would say, well, uh, this uh, it's a Sheldon Leonard type. Get me a Sheldon Leonard, Leonard type. And they type. said, well, Sheldon Leonard is available. No, he, we don't want him. <laughs> oh yes, we we've all we've all gone, all gone that. Through Certainly, through. I'm a much lesser light than Sheldon, but and, and you know he's such a, a marvelous all round actor. Mm -hmm. he, he was a great classic actor, and they did mm -hmm. a lot of stuff on the stage. But he did so well in that thing, and he gained so much fame both on the screen and and then for years, you know, he was on the uh, Benny Show oh, yes. doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you get cast in it. I think in, in most everyone's minds, you're cast to a degree. Uh, in the old days of radio, I could almost tell the kind of part it was going to be by the director who hired me. Mm -hmm. Some saw me as a, a rural uh, hay raker, and somebody else saw me as a booming um, second-rate politician. And uh, it, it it's good that, that people don't all think alike. <laughs> if you're playing the like the Indian said, everybody would want his squaw. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we. Uh, variety, I think, uh, it's kind of the, the the springboard on which an actor works. And none of us, I, I think, likes to get tight unless stand-up comic or someone has become ex excessively um, successful. Like uh, you can't imagine Harry Langdon doing anything but what he did, mm -hmm. and uh, 
Jimmy Durante and this, that, and the other thing. But uh, I think the the uh, average actor does not like to be too closely um, confined. Mm -hmm. in, in well, it's more challenge too oh, in, sure. a, in a variety of yeah. roles. A a major star on any of the uh, areas, radio, TV, movies, they almost uh, always end up playing themselves. But yeah, a good and that too is a rare mm -hmm. is a rare uh, ability. Mm -hmm. Well, there was more of that I think in the in the forties than there is today. Uh, example: Jimmy Stewart almost always kind of played Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. He had different roles, but he was really and we wanted him yes, as Jimmy and, Stewart. Yes, and uh, amazingly enough, in whatever he played, even as Jimmy Stewart, he was believable. Yes, and acceptable. Mm -hmm. Look at Errol Flynn. Mm -hmm. He played all the great Western heroes uh, of all time. With the, what was the one Dodge City? Yeah, he he was the town cleaner up. Olivia de Havilland, uh, as British as they make them, and uh, I think uh, Michael Curtiz directed it. So there was <laughs> there was a, a triumph. Yeah, a, triumph a real variety. Yeah. Yes. Well, speaking of Dodge City, you spent a lot of time on radio in Dodge City, didn't you? I sure did. Eleven years, nearly. Eleven with, uh, years. You were uh, Chester. Chester. On the Gunsmoke the first Chester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill he, Conrad was Doc, mm -hmm. and Howard uh, McNair. Or Conrad Bill was Conrad was Dylan, Dylan uh -huh. and uh, Howard McNair played Doc, and a fine actress by the name of Georgia Ellis played uh, Kitty. Now, this is a show for radio that came along more or less at the end of... Or yes. at the beginning of the end of the radio yes. days, and we yet it lasted for all of those years. Yes. Uh, I'm glad we, by that time, we were recorded ahead, and we were all very grateful that uh, we had enough shows recorded and enough shows in the, uh, in the can, so to speak, that we did not know when we were doing our last one. I don't... Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it would have been a very enjoyable day for us to go in there knowing that uh, that this was it. it was because coming we to had, close. I missed five out of uh, about 530 uh, because I was overseas making a picture called Young Lions and we ran into bad weather. And uh, so I missed, I, I was written out of five. I was just going to ask, did they replace you or write no, you out? They, they wrote, just wrote they you wrote out. You weren't out. in on I that. Was, uh, I think one week I had mumps and another week I was <laughs> sent on an errand <laughs> and got lost. I don't know. Those uh, were really fine programs. Uh, they were, uh, uh, I guess you could say, adult westerns for yes, radio. That's as how they were billed, mm -hmm. uh, adult mm -hmm. westerns. They, well, they, I think, uh, as a lot of shows have done now, I think we entered... Uh, areas that westerns, indeed, that radio shows had not entered before. There was a little of the psychological involved, and and uh, there were instances where sometimes right did not uh, triumph, mm -hmm. as in the real world. And the the thing about Gunsmoke, uh, it became a labor of love for all of us. Uh, I know I, I still have a big library of uh, Western fact and fiction mm -hmm. of that era. And uh, John Meston, who was the uh, chief writer on there, said, gosh, this is the hardest show to write because everybody knows as far as dates and whatnot are concerned. Everyone knows if I'm right, he said, I have to be doubly careful mm -hmm. on my research. But we we were a pretty intact group there. We had the same director, the same assistant director, the same script girl, the same engineer, the same sound crew. The music was the same, and uh, uh, in addition to the four regulars, uh, there probably were not more than 20 or 25 people mm -hmm. that were used. It formed a pretty tight nucleus uh, stock company, as it were, um, for that. And uh, the show, uh, I think that if, if we had been given just an outline, I think that Bill and Howard and Georgia and I and some of the regulars, I think we could have ad-libbed a show if... if it was that uh, um, tight and that close? Yeah. Uh, you were so we got close to know to each other's uh -huh. timing so well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
anticipate anticipate each other's thoughts. And I remember little things like, uh, well, Dylan had told Chester to put some wood on the fire, and the sound of the logs going on there, and I went. <coughs> He said, well, get out of the smoke. <laughs> Just as an ad lib, huh? <laughs> I said, green. Uh -huh. said, you should have got dry. And then we went on with whatever <laughs> we were doing. And things like that. that uh, You really got into it. That you you gave really, us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what kind of reaction was there from the listening audience at this time? Because from, from it was really a different kind of a Western. Yes, it was. And we got it. We pulled a tremendous amount of mail, mm -hmm. and I would say 99% of it was favorable. Now, you know, Matt Dillon, as a character, the name was, uh, I'm sure there have been Matt Dillons, even as there is a young Matt Dillon mm -hmm. on the screen today, but I'm sure that in, in years past there were many Matt Dillons, but none who figured in um, Dodge City or Points West. It was a name made up by John Meston. But we had a letter at one, one time from the um, Dodge City Chamber of Commerce asking if we sh could shed light as to what years Matt Dillon was there. They said, mm -hmm. we have ascertained that there was a Matt Dillon who was a marshal here at one time, oh. but we don't know what years. Well, so far as our research was concerned, Matt Dillon was a fictitious character. Yet a lot of the storyline was based on, or at least the setting was based on historical oh, yes. appropriateness. Yes, right? uh -huh. and uh, John and uh, other writers, E. Jack Newman and uh, Kathleen Height, uh, were great contributors. They worked in names that were famous or infamous, as the case might mm -hmm. be, uh, mm -hmm. that area, like the the Earp boys and uh, Clay Allison and... Uh, um, I, I think the very first one we did, uh, I don't know, the, yeah, Billy the Kid mm -hmm. worked into it. And uh, that, I, I think, lent an air of uh, reality and verisimilitude to the, to the thing, removing it from the strictly uh, fiction. Uh, Stigma, uh -huh. as it were. There was so much, not so much, but there was a noticeable amount of uh, inaction as compared to The Lone Ranger and Hopalong Cassidy and other westerns that had preceded uh, Gunsmoke on radio. There would be many scenes where it was just uh, uh, almost a quiet uh, conversation yeah. going on uh, between Matt and, a lot more and yourself or... or but you see, the sound, the <coughs> sound kids on there, the sound men, were were so dedicated to it mm -hmm. too. Uh, if the shot was a 44, they recorded a 44 shot, or if it were a 22, or a 38, or a shotgun, it wasn't just a bang bang. Mm -hmm. They were extremely careful and extremely solicitous of exactly the right sound. And if we were in a riverbed, the horse's hoofs ran through sand. If it was uh, grass, they thundered on a, mm -hmm. a swishy sound of, of grass or gravel or, or whatever. Those kids worked hard. They devoted many, many hours outside of the, uh, the, the pay <laughs> load mm -hmm. uh, to making it successful. And, and uh, uh, Rex Corey, when we were using live music, his music was original, but he based it on themes and snatches of song that were popular mm -hmm. at that time. It's interesting to note that, again, as I, I mentioned earlier, this, was, this came in as a new show near the end of the basic radio period. It yes. started, I guess, about 1951 or 52, didn't it? Uh, 52. Two, yeah. And there were a few sporadic ones, I think, in late... Uh, in late '51, but the first, the first show to go on as part of the series was in um, April of '52. Of '52. Uh, mm -hmm. And 
I would think. Now, you had a sponsor in the beginning. I think you had L&M uh, cigarettes. They came in later. I, I think we had a sponsor. Uh, I think we had a sponsor on, on one show. We used to, in those days, we, we did it live, and they taped it. And then it was we did it live Sunday night. And it was repeated uh, on Saturday mornings, as I recall, hmm. by tape. And then when we started uh, taping it, because Bill had to go away, he was working on a picture, and Norman McDonald had other assignments and that. So then we started, uh, after about two or three years, we started taping two every other Saturday. When you taped, you didn't tape it before an audience, though? No. No, at that. In the live show, was that an, an audience in the no. beginning? No. Never, an, never no. an audience. It, it, it's fascinating to me to know that you got good ratings in well into the 50s, middle 50s, late 50s with all of this stuff, and even at the end when the, the there were no sponsors to buy the whole show anymore because everybody was turning their attention to television, uh, CBS continued to keep the program on, and you had a series of participating sponsors. They yes. had the spot they were yes, we spot did. After, advertisers. Well, after L and M, I think L and M went from us to the live to the TV show, didn't they? I think they were on. And the, yeah. was it. See, we it was three years after we were on as uh, on radio that it went to television, mm -hmm. and I think. Uh, no, for a long time L and M sponsored both, and then and then I think General Foods took over, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or else it was reversed. General Foods did it first. At any rate, you had some sponsorship on radio for this, which at yes, time we did. And at the free. time we went off, we were the high, of course there weren't too many left, but we had the highest rating of any mm -hmm. uh, radio show uh, on CBS when when we went off the air. You were Chester Proudfoot. Mm -hmm. on radio, yet they changed his name uh, for TV, and I assume that's because of the uh, the limp that was given the character, right, on TV? No, it's kind of an interesting uh, thing, you know, how uh, careful uh, sometimes people are. They get, uh, they get almost uh, paranoid about uh, the idea of plagiarism. Bill and I used to, we, we played games with each other sometimes and with the rest of the cast too. And Bill would love to hang you up on a, a broken speech. You'd say, well, if I... And he would just let you hang there until <laughs> you finished it. And Bill was, uh, bless his heart, uh, he was marvelous to break up because he was like Edward Arnold. When he broke up, the, the earth shook, you know, <laughs> it, that magnificent voice and... Well, but he left me hanging one day, and I said, as sure as my name is Chester Wesley Proudfoot. And he said, Chester Wesley Proudfoot, where did I come up? I said, well, when you see a broken speech, break in. And I won't say it. He named me originally. Mm -hmm. On the first show, I was just Townsman. Mm -hmm. And Bill said, he's got to have a name. I can't say, hey, Townsman, come here a minute. I want to <laughs> talk to you. So he named me Chester as he named uh, Doc, he named him Dr. Charles Adams because um, Howard played him as though he, he could anticipate the taste of blood a little bit and, <laughs> and did weird things in the full of the moon. So he called him Dr. <laughs> Charles Adams. That's how he got the name. And Chester, well, then that, that name stuck. Well, there was a man by the name of Hal Hudson uh, who was a, an executive at uh, CBS. We were good friends. We used to argue a bit, but uh, he, when it transferred to TV, they changed the name of Proudfoot to Good. And uh, I met him in the hall one day, and I, I said, uh, you, you really needn't have uh, changed the name. I said, even if CBS doesn't trust me, I trust them. I said, I, I wouldn't. You can still use the name Proudfoot if you want to. I probably stole it from some. <laughs> some uh, that, you know, but that, that's how that happened. It was changed from 
He said, well, we felt that Prabhupada had an Indian named Sound. Oh. <laughs> I said, well, if uh, Chester came from Oklahoma, maybe there was a little mm. Indian blood in yeah. him. Who knows? Well, they have vice presidents at the networks who have nothing to do but worry about little things That's like right. that, I think. Vice president of nitpicking. <laughs> <laughs> now, besides the uh, creating the role of Chester on Gunsmoke, Parley Bear, you did a lot of other radio work over the years, haven't oh, you? Oh, my, yes, I was... Uh, I was very, very lucky in uh, radio. There was hardly a, a radio show uh, on the dramatic show on the West Coast that I didn't get a crack at once in a while. And, uh, of course, Lux was one of the great loves of all of us, but Lux, and Screen Directors Guild, and uh, The Whistler, Escape, Suspense. Uh, first nighter, those Websters. Uh, you worked with you, those Websters. You worked with uh, Willard Waterman for a while yes. on the, and on that. Yes, and and on uh, he did a lot of first nighters too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he, of course, had replaced uh, Hal Perry on the Gildersleeve show. And you worked with Hal after he left Gildersleeve. Well, I it's, think, the, it, it's the other way around. Ha Willard was the original. Um, Great Gildersleeve, and then he he left the show, and Hal became uh, the Great Gildersleeve, and then and then years later, Willard went back to doing Gildersleeve after Hal. Oh, you uh, mean Willard had a, a small part as Gildersleeve with the originally be, be, uh -huh, be, ah. before before uh, mm. this goes way 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 back. Yeah. But yes, and I I was for two seasons with uh, Hal Piriana. On a show called Honest Harold, the Homemaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You uh, were part of a uh, select group of actors, I think, who appeared in virtually all of the uh, CBS programs in the 1950s. CBS was the last, the network that hung on the longest. Just to with radio. dramatic shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the workshop and escape and and so many uh, things like yes, that. Yes, and then, and then you remember Armor Star Theater on Saturday mornings mm -hmm. and. Uh, Oh, gosh. I did. Then I did The Mayor of the Town with uh, Lionel Barrymore and did a lot of specials with him. Then uh, Hallmark Playhouse. Mm -hmm. We did uh, a man by the name of Art Ronnie some years ago who was doing a little piece. He's a, a PR man at uh, Warner's now, but he was doing a little piece on me, and he said, to you, then, he said, I, you have done around 70 or 80 pictures, nearly as I could figure out. And you had done close to 500 television shows. And he said, when I got up to 5,000, I quit talking on, or quit counting on radio. Mm -hmm. Well, I would imagine that uh, that would be the case. You, I'm sure, like so many of the other actors out here, were, were doubling on some of the shows and oh, yes. were doing more than one show in, in a day. Yes, you... you uh, he just said you hadn't really arrived until you had a conflict. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find it easy to move into television after the as as TV was coming in on the scene? Yes, <clears throat> yes, I did. Uh, but I was uh, I had the advantage of being stage trained, mm -hmm. and uh, some of those who didn't have who couldn't move were strictly radio. Uh, had a little difficulty, but on they, they were few and far between. No, we we all made the transition uh, pretty easily, uh, with this exception. Very often, uh, we were not playing the kind of parts on TV that we played on radio mm -hmm. because we didn't we didn't look it. You didn't look like no. you sounded. No. Yeah. And of course, how did you sound? It was all up to the imagination of the person who was well, listening to you on the that's radio. That's true. Uh, I think that radio is the ideal medium uh, for a performer because if 12 million people were listening you were giving 12 million performances mm -hmm. and it uh, it it's too bad that it had to uh, that it had to to go but it uh, it was a lot of fun while it lasted <laughs> well you contributed a lot to it and uh, oh, thank you appreciate I, all of that I hope I work. did we we all tried we were all and there was as much Glow and uh, and generating in 
radio as there was in, in anything else. Uh, in the days of live radio, every night was the first night, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, shows like uh, uh, Hallmark Playhouse and uh, Screen Directors Guild and uh, Lux and all of that. You did those in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. And in the early days of radio, like Dr. Christian and all that, we did two shows because you had to do one for the East and one for the mm -hmm. West Coast. Mm -hmm. So you gave a show generally anywhere between 4.30 and 6.30. And then you... That would run in the East. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you came back and did one anywhere from um, 7.30 to 9.30 or something. Were they basically identical programs or did they ever make any changes from the f west coast to the east coast or no, vice versa? No, the only changes, changes that were made were inadvertent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you know the, the old, uh, remember those old machines called Ditto machines? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forerunner of the mimeograph and well, the they Xerox. Were kinda, and yeah, yeah, like a bit of Xerox. Reproduction, yeah. But it was blue and it was a glistening piece of paper and the printing came out blue. And I remember we had a snappy five or ten seconds one night on Dr. Uh, Dr. Christian. And the electrician, just as we got started, uh, inadvertently threw on a blue border and all our pages went absolutely <laughs> blank. And the only one who was not aware of it was uh, Gene Hersholt, who used to sit at a table and had a table lamp oh. uh, there. And... He wondered what all the consternation was, but it was pretty lively there at the front microphones for a while until someone got over there and <laughs> whacked the electrician, <laughs> got some white borders back on. But those were the only changes uh -huh. that took place between the East Coast it's and the West Coast. Occasionally yeah. an actor didn't show up for the second show, I suppose. But uh, Once in a great, great while, uh, they, they wouldn't show up. And strangely enough, and I'm not putting the onus on anybody, but... Oftentimes they'd have a guest star, a movie mm -hmm. star who did it and thought, that's it. And he, he wouldn't come back and you'd see the directors like Fred McKay or uh, Bill Gay or these people who were using the movie stars uh, or, <laughs> or just on them like leeches saying, now remember, you have to do this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, when they, I remember Burt Lancaster on, on a Lux. Mm -hmm came back a little late and the late uh, Jeff Chandler uh, mm -hmm. played the first half of the show as as Burt Land. Oh, he had it. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> yeah. Although those were, those were moments that that aged you but they were fun. They're special moments. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of special moments in the career of Parley Bear. We're going to continue with this conversation in just a moment. Parley Bear we were talking a little while ago about the Lux Radio Theater, and you you must have played that show a hundred times, if if once, I'm sure. Probably, yes. Yeah, because your name always, as we listen to some of those old shows, your name always pops up in, in the cast yes. somewhere along the line, either as a first or second supporting player or somewhere down the line, because I guess they just used people well, all over they the would, place. Well, they would bring uh, generally two stars or mm -hmm. three, uh, and if they could get them to, to recreate their own parts, they would. But then they would cast the uh, second leads and supporting players from uh, radio cast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the real, the real pros who knew what they were doing on, on radio. I suppose the well, stars had to have a little extra coaching sometimes. Well, you sure. see, Lux Radio Theater, unlike many shows, there was a, that was a four-day rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd have a... The first day would consist of readings and cuts and uh, <laughs> getting to know you type of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, we didn't even get up on our feet the first day. And then the, the second day, we would uh, get up and they'd start micing mm -hmm. and uh, whatnot. And then uh, the rehearsals generally were uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Monday. So you had Sunday off, didn't do anything. Was, it, was there someone from the production crew feverishly working on Sunday, tightening things up, or did it just had the... By that by time, Saturday? it was pretty well timed. Uh -huh. The commercials were in, and, mm -hmm. the, and we had already had uh, two or three dress rehearsals with the, the orchestra, and the orchestra came in on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
by by Friday, uh, unless there were real uh, script difficulties, it had pretty well gelled and and had settled. Now you did the Lux always. A Lux always was done before a large live audience, or at yes. least it has appeared to me to be a large audience. About how how what size an audience did they have? Do you know the uh, uh, Huntington Hartford Theater mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. L.A. On, on Vine Street on between Vine Street. Sunset and Well, oh, that's Hollywood. where that's where it was uh-huh. done. And the seating capacity, I should judge, would have been about 800 between 800, 800 and, and 900. That's a good size. It's a good uh, size theater. Uh, theater. And uh, depending upon the show, how many uh, live sound effects like gunshots or this out of the other, if it were a western, mm-hmm. uh, it would depend. But it was uh, used a lot of velours and tormentors and teasers, and it was set up. It was elegantly um, costumed uh, the stage. Uh, with velours and velvets hung at various angles so as to conduct and uh, challenge uh, uh, channel sound. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes the pieces of velour would be replaced with flats if they wanted an outdoors effect and uh, very often in the show uh, during the commercials Flats would be substituted for velours and or vice versa in order to to uh, create various outside or inside mm-hmm. effects. Uh, the uh, orchestra sat uh, was at the rear, often baffled with uh, Silatex boards shutting it off that were mirrored uh, with plastic set at an angle so that it didn't get too much boom. There was a, a booth on the side and a booth up in the, uh, what would uh, be like the movie booth, you know, the oh, projection booth. Oh, the projection booth, booth up uh-huh. in that section. Uh-huh. And uh, chairs were in a row, the, uh, depending upon the size of the cast, either a single or a double row, and uh, two or three microphones. Uh, used. Generally, each star had his or her own microphone. And then uh, there were, as I say, depending upon the number of the cast, the um, either two or three more microphones mm-hmm. uh, were there. If Humphrey Bogart were playing opposite Lauren Bacall on this, they would each be working from a separate microphone? Yes. Even through the love scenes and things like that? Yes. Uh-huh. And then uh, they but generally uh, posted so they could see each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would they be very far apart? Four feet, six feet? They... Yeah, probably about six feet apart, mm-hmm. so that uh, uh, one's mic did not pick up the other oh, ones. I see. And then, as the supporting players or any of the actors who were, or actresses in the show would were needed, they would just come up to whichever mic was yes, designated to them. Uh huh. You well, you marked it on your script, or very often too, if you had a very intimate scene with. Um, uh, a star that you were, you know, supposed to be hiding in a uh, ditch or waiting to rob a bank or something, mm-hmm. then you would get on that microphone with that star to, to create speak that in your, kind of a to entre nous uh-huh. a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And where was the sound effects department at this time? They were at one side or the mm-hmm. other, generally to the left. Generally to the left, and there would as you face on the as left you as you face the stage. Yeah, and so there would be. Anywhere from one, two, or three and people, they, I suppose, doing yes, sound. Yes, depending upon what they had. And then, of course, they had their own set of microphones. It was a, uh, And then a set of microphones uh, for the orchestra. Mm-hmm. And then if this particular show had an awful lot of people in it for mob scenes and whatnot, there would be uh, a, a mob scene microphone over to the other side. So the engineer had his hands full. Uh, they really put it together so nicely. Yes. Uh, the audience uh, at home listening uh, uh, could certainly visualize whatever the story was. And oh, yes. It's about the only time you ever realized that this was a theatrical production, because it was the Lux Radio Theater, was when there would be a ripple of response from the audience, the studio audience, and that would often come uh, in a light romantic scene or... Uh, or when, whether it would be a funny line delivered or something. Yes. Yeah. 
but most of the time the audiences behave themselves if mm -hmm. uh, if something went wrong they they'd get a little unruly and titter and giggle when they shouldn't but that <laughs> was fortunately rare yeah. Cecil B. DeMille and uh, William Keeley yes. were the uh, the hosts really they yes. really weren't the producers of the uh, well, no, they did uh, mm -hmm. uh, they they came in and just uh, played a part mm -hmm. were the commercials done live on the stage or were they done from another studio off the stage John Milton Kennedy would at, would be talking to a new starlet or something about how she used Lux soap. They generally did those just a little off camera, uh, off stage, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, um, any adjustments that needed to be done could be like rearranging mm -hmm. the velours or rearranging the flats. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the stars had their pages uh, stapled to thin pieces of cardboard so it wouldn't rattle. Well, that got to be a pretty good size hand. So, oh, well, so for an hour after show, the first yeah. act was over, uh, uh, an assistant would take those mm -hmm. and check to make sure that their other pages are in the right order and put them. They each had a little stand by their by their uh, microphones oh, that uh, because they they weren't used to it and they had long parts. Of course, we were used to to holding our papers and changing our our script so that. Uh, it didn't rattle. Uh, if one rattled his script, he was in disgrace for days. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that they, uh, at some in some cases, would just take the 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 used page and drop it to the floor? Seen well, that a some lot, you know, some people a did that, mm -hmm. and I think that was done mainly in movies. That was a very disastrous <laughs> thing to do. I can imagine uh, because uh, there was always the danger of walking on it. And then it sounded like you were walking down a snowy path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the case of the studios, the non-audience studios, where you had just four uh, walls, so to speak, in the control booth, and it was very uh, generally very hard, very highly polished vinyl floor, mm -hmm. where maybe they would put rugs under the uh, microphone or the area where you were walking. But those papers, if they were thrown down, uh, you could slip on them. Mm -hmm. It was it was a hazardous thing to to just throw papers willy nilly uh, around. Mm -hmm. the, the accepted method was to just quietly slide it and back, put it in back of the uh, other back, stack uh -huh. of pages. Yeah, yeah that uh, some people still did that. I know Jack Johnstone used to direct. He he never went in the booth. He directed as they did 400 years ago. He'd put earphones on, had his own booth, and sat right, or stood right in the studio with you, which most of us found <laughs> extremely annoying. He was a very affable man, but he, uh, I said, gosh, hey, the, your credit should read directed and conducted by, because <laughs> he, he'd uh, wave and point and whatnot, and he insisted on certain weird techniques that uh, after a while you rebelled at but if you wanted to work you did it <laughs> <laughs> which did you prefer doing a, a live show or a, uh, a non-audience show uh, on radio on radio oh I didn't care I, I liked I liked doing them both mm -hmm. uh, if it were a comedy show uh, I much preferred an audience I, I can't even think of a, a radio comedy show without an audience. Oh, some of Thick them. Thick and Sade. Did, think uh, and yeah, Sade. Those, uh, the daytime shows. Yeah, some of those did, things, but, I uh, suppose. Gee, they, you know, it would have just been... Uh, it would have just been terrible for, say, Burns and Allen or Benny or mm -hmm. Skelton or any of those people to work without an audience oh. because... Well, they, they did, needed the, the audience they reaction that for impetus, their timing. Sure, yeah. sure they did for timing. Now you worked a little bit on radio uh, for uh, or with, I should say, uh, Ozzy and Harriet. Yes, I did just a few shows before they went over to television. But then they brought you with to TV, and you spent uh, quite a few years with them. Seven years. Seven years, and you were there, one of Ozzy's neighbors, Neighbor. uh, Darby. Darby, yeah, yeah. Darby. Uh -huh. Darby. <laughs> I uh, yes, and then they, I went back. Then they switched the storyline to where it featured the kids more in their college activities and mm -hmm. whatnot, but. <laughs> they, were, they called us Ozzy's posse. We used to, <laughs> we used to go 
back occasionally. Then I I I worked with Ozzy uh, several times on other um, projects that he was directing, and and when they did that series Ozzy's Girls, I did mm-hmm. the pilot on that and, and appeared several times. Uh, on that and uh, well, you were a familiar face then to the the audience as well, so that uh, oh yeah would be part of the, uh, the yeah uh, uh, Lyle Talbot, and Frank Cady, mm-hmm. Gordon Jones before he passed away, and Billy McLean was a regular Hal Smith who uh, later played uh, Otis the uh, the drunk on the uh, uh, Andy Griffith show. Oh yes, did you ever play? The TV Gunsmoke? Never. You never did. They wouldn't. Uh, couldn't find the spot for you on the yes. uh, on the TV. Uh, but uh, the foolish pride, I wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. No, I didn't. Uh, we we felt that we got kind of a dirty deal on there. We didn't know it was going to go TV until we read it in the uh, in the trade papers, uh-huh. and they didn't audition any of us. And Bill would have just been ideal for that. He was, uh, as a matter of fact, to describe him and describe Wyatt Earp, you would use exactly the same adjectives. And um, so Bill finally wound up directing some, but he would never appear on it. And, well, you uh, say Bill Conrad would have been ideal for Wyatt Earp on uh, that. You mean I said Matt he Dillon? Direct, he would have been ideal for, mm-hmm. for Matt Dillon. I said because he and Wyatt Earp, on whom Dylan was uh, based, uh-huh. um, uh, it, you know, in those days, a, a tall man was five nine or five ten. Mm-hmm. A six foot man was out of the ordinary. One hundred and you mean back years. in the western? Yeah. yeah. But weren't they really producing that uh, for the, the audiences of the? Oh sure they were. The, of the sure 60s, they were. Sure. You know? Oh sure. They didn't care how tall they were then, but mm-hmm. I. The the only thing I think that they could have been a little more gentlemanly in their no, treatment of yes. us, uh, if they had said, "Would you care to audition?" We don't think you're right, but uh, if you would, mm. uh, would you like to audition? Or uh, maybe we would have been right. You know, we don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you there. It's kind of tough after you've been doing this for so long, and then all of and a sudden. And it was a little irritating. They'd say, "We'd write our ad libs in," you know. And, and uh, I used to find myself getting a little hot under the collar. The first few years, they were a half hour, you know, instead of an hour. Mm-hmm. And I'd hear some of my write-ins uh, there, and I'd, I'd uh, faunch a little bit, but <laughs> it didn't do much <laughs> And good. you mean that some of the uh, TV shows were based on the radio scripts then? Sure, word for word. Mm. Mm-hmm. They, 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 those half-hour ones, mm-hmm. they, they did. They just... Uh, Cut them a little bit to accommodate the, the sign-on and, and the um, commercials, but they were, and we rewrote and wrote and ad-libbed and put in and whatnot, and they they were not above using <laughs> some of our choices lines. Well, that was the naturalness then of the of the show that you that you brought to it, you and. The, and uh, Bill Conrad and the, and the others, as you described earlier about the... Well, like the, the, I remember, uh, and I, I get on him about it every now and again, that uh, Dennis Weaver said, we had nothing but the plain canvas upon which to draw. And I said, well, then you were drawing from the underside, or else you used just water brushes because <laughs> the pictures were there, boy. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the other things you did on, on TV? On TV? In series, in series, or... Well, I was on the Andy Griffith show for mm-hmm. three years, uh, and I did uh, many Bewitched. I did uh, oh, Scads of the I Love Lucy show. I did mm-hmm. Benny, uh, Danny Thomas. Um, movies of the Week, uh, Have Gun, Will Travel, The Rifleman. Mm-hmm. Uh, most recently, uh, Dukes of Hazard, uh, Trauma Center, Three's Company. So uh, you're still keeping right up with everybody, everybody on all of these things. Now I know you just recently came out of the uh, hospital with a uh, was it a quadruple bypass? No, five. Five. five what is that? A quintuplet? 
Qu- quintuple, I guess. <laughs> quintuple? Uh, quintuple bypass, yeah. And how do you feel? I feel good. You look wonderful. I feel uh, You getting good along off. all right with so it? So sure. All I've got to do is have a call and I'll... You're on the, and I'll be on the trail <laughs> again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I have to go, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> That's right. Now, you have a very distinctive voice that uh, helped you out very well during the radio days, and I know that you can double and do variations on that voice for whatever character you need, but you have been playing uh, a, a TV version of, a, I guess, almost, a, I guess you couldn't call it a cookie monster, but uh, uh, one of the elves in the, or the head elf, is it, in the Keebler uh, commercial? Yes, I've done Ernie Keebler the, uh, oh, for 14 years. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. Not near long enough. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Uh, as a matter of fact, I just made that. There's a new product coming out called Soft Batch Cookies. Mm-hmm. And I just uh, I just did some demo spots uh, just before I went into the hospital. And we'll be making some more of those in a in another uh, week or two. And I've been very lucky there, too. I, I, I don't know how many I've done, but uh, I've done it for 14 years. Well, that's really... That's a... That's a nice little annuity right there, I would mm-hmm. say, isn't it? But it, it, like, it, 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 like we used to say with gun smoke, it was on. It allows it allows one just that extra degree of haughtiness that's necessary in dealing with recalcitrant ag- agents. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is coming up next for you then, outside of the uh, the uh, Keebler commercials? And the well, I have a movie that I just completed called Chattanooga Choo Choo that's up for release. And uh, I had another picture a few months ago called Dr. Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I did one that they're having some difficulty with called White Dog. White Dog? Uh Uh-huh. And uh, I'm going to do a picture called The Albos. And I an interesting thing, uh, just about a year ago now, I was called to do a... It was... Basically, I guess you'd call it an experimental theater. It was a short. Mm-hmm. Uh, Louise Fletcher, who won the Oscar for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Robert Loggia, and um, Belafonte. Uh, what? Her? Hmm? Sherry. The girl? Sherry. Sherry? Mm-hmm. Uh, Belafonte was in it. It's based on an old W. Somerset mom story. And played uh, a number of years ago in a trilogy of uh, W. Uh, Somerset Mom uh, short stories, three of them. This one was called The Colonel's Lady. They changed the title, and uh, it's now called Overnight Sensation. They modernized it and rewrote it mm-hmm. and changed it. But uh, I, I played in it, and it was up for an Academy Award for live short subjects and they had the filming on it we don't know what's uh, what's happened to it we won't know until the 9th but uh, out of 90 some odd submitted it wound up in the final three Uh, that was a lot of fun to do and I was uh, John Bloom directed it and produced it and uh, I was very proud to be a part of that it was uh, it was very, very nice, very nice indeed. Then I, I lost a, a picture with Bill Asher uh, while I was in the hospital, uh, but uh, I worked for him a lot. He did uh, uh, nearly all of the um, Bewitched oh, yes, and sir. Temperatures mm-hmm. Rising, which he did, but they had to go ahead for with the production, so I lost a, a good part in that, but you... You lose one here and you pick one up there. Well, I don't think your hospitalization slowed you down any. You seem to have just, you, you say, oh, doggone it, I was in here and I missed that part, but <laughs> uh, pick up again. Uh, you oh, can uh, be very proud of all of the things you've done. I think that you contributed an awful lot over the years uh, with your talents to making the audiences, whether they're movie audiences or TV viewers, or uh, we have a special interest in the radio listeners of, of the Times, you did an awful lot to entertain those people, and uh, your talents uh, uh, are really very special. And I want to thank you for, for well, doing that. Well, that that's work. very kind of you. I uh, I feel that whatever I did, it was a privilege to do, and I'm I'm lucky to have been a part of all this. God's been very good to me 
in that uh, he has allowed me to uh, pursue uh, the various facets of show business that I most love, including the circus, the stage, the screen, TV, radio. And uh, it hasn't really my, my poor father went to his grave wondering when I was going to settle down and get a job. <laughs> but this, this, has been, this has been fun. And uh, Chuck, I'm, I'm grateful to you for inviting me here this afternoon. Uh, it's nice to say hello to people who remember us. And thank you very much for, for including me in your list. You, you got a lot of my old friends. Yeah, uh, we've been talking to a lot of, of folks. Yeah. And special and, uh, one is Parley Barron. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you.